clinical psychologist at the University of Virginia. I'm Peter Hobson. I'm trained as a psychiatrist, a psychoanalyst, and experimental psychologist, and I work at the Institute of Child Health at University College London and the Tavistock Clinic in London. And I'm Carolyn Becker. I'm a clinical psychologist, and I work at Trinity University. We're going to be talking today about mental disorders, and our question is, mental disorder, what is that? And I'm going to start out by talking with you about some of the reasons why this is such a challenging topic. I'm then going to turn it over to Carolyn, and she's going to talk about some controversy over current uh, focus on the idea that mental disorders are brain disorders with a strongly biological explanation. And then uh, Peter's going to bring us home by using some case ma material to illustrate how he conceptualizes disorder and the implications of that conceptualization for treatment. This issue reflects a long debate in our field with a lot of changes over time. And we're really just going to touch on some of the key issues, but I think it's a really good time to be having this conversation. Right now, the field is in the final stages of revising what's called the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual for Defining Mental Disorders, known as the DSM, and a new version will be coming out very shortly. And so this issue really is forefront in the field right now. The DSM is, in some ways, the gold standard sort of book for determining the criteria for different disorders and has been very, very influential. And because of that, I thought it made sense as a good starting point to talk about how the DSM defines mental disorder because of the influence that it's had. So these are the features that it lays out. It says, a mental disorder is a clinically significant behavioral or psychological syndrome or pattern that occurs in an individual. It's associated with present distress or disability. And it must not be merely an expectable and culturally sanctioned response to a particular event. In other words, we don't want to pathologize a normal period of sadness, for example, following the loss of a loved one. It's a manifestation of a behavioral, psychological, or biological dysfunction in the individual. Wide variety of options there. And it is neither deviant behavior such as the political protest, nor conflicts that are primarily between the individual and society. <laughs> so its current emphasis is on a list of criteria. So there's a bunch of category labels for different disorders, and then lists of criteria that are designed to describe the phenomenology of the disorder. An important point to keep in mind is that it is intentionally atheoretical. What I mean by that is that it doesn't make an assumption about the source or the cause of the disorder. And there's a good reason that it does that. But that is distinct from concepts like disease. Now, there was a bit of giggling as I went through the criteria for disorders. And I think part of the reason is that some of the <coughs> features that are listed to define the disorder are really vague and could mean 500 different things. And this has been a major criticism about the DSM, is that it's really sidestepped the whole issue of defining mental disorder, which is interesting given that in some ways, you know, it is the key manual that people are using in this regard. But it was sidestepped, I think, for some good reasons. Still problematic, but uh, intentionally sidestepped. And the reasons are that people don't agree on how we should define this. And if they wanted the DSM to be used widely, they sort of had to leave it intentionally vague so that people would adopt it. But we have a real challenge. For example, clinically significant distress or impairment. Clinically significant is never defined. So chances are all of us in this room would come up with a slightly different line about where we should make those kinds of cuts. The challenging part, though, is that any of the criteria that we think about that should be used to define when we have a disorder each have some problems. So it's not an easy task. So one popular idea is that we should say, well, if we're going to say that this is abnormal behavior, it should be rare or deviant in some way, right? How can we say that it is abnormal if it's really, really common? Seems to make sense. We have a problem. Approximately 29% of the population will have an anxiety disorder in their lifetime. When you take a look at disorders as a whole, we get to close to 50% of people will have a diagnosable mental disorder. We're not looking at anything rare all of a sudden. Okay, so that alone is not going to do it for us. 
Well, maybe it should be distressing. So this is another of the popular ideas, that the person should find it really upsetting to have this problem. And again, seems to make sense on the surface. And for lots of disorders, that will work well. But what about anorexia nervosa, where the person may like to be thin? What about substance dependence, where the person doesn't necessarily agree that the use of the substance, the drinking, is a problem? What about the person with narcissistic personality disorder? They think you've got the problem, not them. All right, so we got a problem with that criterion as well. OK, maybe then we should focus on something that is harmful or impairing in some way. And many people would agree that this does need to be part of the definition. But it gets a little tricky when we start to look at the details. Harmful in what way? Impairing based on what standard? Take, for example, the person who lives in a small apartment, and she spends 10 to 12 hours a day cleaning that apartment. 10 to 12 hours a day cleaning a small apartment? Seems pretty excessive. So maybe this person has a diagnosis of obsessive compulsive disorder, right? Repeatedly cleaning the same thing over and over. But what if she likes it? What if she says, eh, I have a good time doing it. I don't really want to be doing other stuff. Is it impairing then? Hard to judge. Maybe it's just kind of an unusual hobby. So again, we have some challenges. And these challenges have led people to say, maybe this is all just socially constructed. Maybe we shouldn't really have disorder labels because this really is just sort of a, a, a social construction that we have created. The idea of disorder maybe doesn't even really exist. And to an extent, it's clear that social construction is playing a role. After all, the, the manuals and all those ways that we diagnose disorders keep changing over time. We keep changing which categories count and which lists of criteria count. So clearly, there's a social element to this. But there's other pieces that are hard to explain then. <coughs> so for example, if you look at the prevalence rate of schizophrenia or schizophrenic-like disorders around the world in incredibly diverse cultures, it's about a 1% prevalence rate all over the place. It's hard to imagine it's just a social construction then when we see this kind of widespread consistency in some aspects. And the question of disorder labels is a really complex one. So an immediate concern is the issue of stigma. And this is an area that I care very strongly about and I hope we'll talk about in the discussion and I know that Carolyn is gonna touch on. It's not a simple case of whether disorder labels are good and ba or bad in terms of stigma. On the one hand, there's no question that it marks an individual, and we have widespread evidence in all kinds of different domains for stigma of mental illness and how that harms people. On the flip side, giving somebody a label also has a lot of positive benefits. It normalizes the experience. It says, you are not alone, and we understand what's going on for you. It opens doors for treatment. So again, it's not a simple picture of sort of the disorder label is good or it's bad. And so it's not all that surprising that the DSM is really, in some ways, just avoided nailing down what we should constitute as a mental disorder. This does leave us in a hard place, though, because it is really premised on the medical model. And while it doesn't use disease language, applying this medical, medical model in the psychological domain has some difficulties. So I told you it's based on all these sort of categories. Well, that's fine, but many of us would say that that's reifying a category that doesn't really exist. So if you look at medical conditions, take something like Down syndrome, there is a defined biological condition. There is a chromosomal disorder that everybody with Down syndrome has. That is far less clear when we start to look at psychological disorders. And so many people say we are not carving nature at its joints because we don't have a homogenous entity that is the disorder. So take borderline personality disorder. To meet criteria, you have to have five out of nine possible symptoms. Well, you start to do the math, and that means two people who have borderline disorder could have literally one symptom only in common with one another. Hard to say we've got a thing that is borderline personality disorder then. In addition, when we start to look at the incredible rates of comorbidity, it's hard to say we have these standalone disorders. I've seen people who literally have eight different diagnoses. How does it even make sense to say you have multiple personality disorders? So we've got, we're in a difficult place. 
And so people have proposed radically different directions, some that we'll talk about today during the discussion, of emphasizing the idea that mental disorders are really all based on neural circuitry and our brain disorders, to saying we should get rid of the disorder concept altogether and instead just focus at the level of interacting and causally connected symptoms. And it's going to be really interesting to see where the field goes as this progresses. I'm not going to say that I have the answer by any means. I do think it's clear, though, that we need to take what's called a biopsychosocial perspective. In other words, we need to think about this from the standpoint of interacting influences of biology, psychology, and society. And that we need to keep in mind that mental processes are on a continuous function. These categories are not really real. And I have yet to meet a client who fits in any single tidy box where one level, one single label could ever capture the complexity of human functioning. And so I'll turn it over to Carolyn now. <laughs> 